Our speaker this morning is Dr. Dr. Malone. Dr. Malone arrived at the Hill in 1999 and has held many different roles. Currently, she is a senior master teacher and the Elizabeth B. Blossom Chair of Humanities, teaching both humanities and United States history. Dr. Malone. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Okay. On a weekend in 1923, Yale football coach T.A.D. Jones is reported to have told his players, quote, gentlemen, you are about to play football for Yale against Harvard. Never again in your lives will you do something so important. You should laugh because while Jones' speech is revered as the greatest pep talk in Yale athletic history, and perhaps in the history of the world, of course, it is also, of course, nonsense. And in fact, it is pernicious nonsense. Pernicious meaning harmful and often harmful in an incremental or subtle way. And the role of athletics in American culture, American education, and American life, and the way we talk about it, often is nonsense, and all too often can be pernicious. This year marks 100 years of USA field hockey, 50 years of Title IX, 50 years of Yale field hockey, as well as the 50th anniversary of my own high school graduation, all of which I have recently participated in marking and celebrating and being honored for being directly involved in. This is also my 24th year at Hill, and that's my 24th year involved in Hill athletics. I want to reflect on some of what I've learned from my experiences and try to put the role of athletics in American life and American education in some perspective. Thus, my topic today is really, it's only a game, or they are only games. Life lessons from life, of which sports is one small, so often oversimplified part. This is odd timing perhaps on the opening day of the World Series from the crazy white haired woman walking around in Phillies gear for the past few weeks. Go Phillies. Birthright Phillies fan here. It's perhaps even more odd coming from one who has had the good fortune and the good luck to experience organized athletics at just about the highest level possible for a woman of my generation. I think I've, I've been 411 since I was 11 years old, but I think you all can see me. The reason your sweaters look like that is because my sweater looks like this. You all got it first, okay? And I'm wearing it for a reason this morning. Um, and for those of you wearing the blue with the white H, here a shout out to the Yale Drama School, the best a cappella music in the world at Yale, the Whiff and Poofs, and um, of course, the wonders of the Yale School of Music and the Yale Rep. But anyway, um, I cite the following to establish that I am not just a grumpy, resentful, anti-athletic wannabe. Grumpy, absolutely. Those of you who know me know that can happen any moment. But I have been actively involved in both field hockey and lacrosse for 60 of my 68 years. I was taught to play and then coached by two of the greatest women to ever play both games, and they both played both games, Joanne Harper and Alice Putnam Willits, both multi-year All-Americans in college, U.S. team players for a decade or more, coaches at the world level, and renowned coaches at the high school and college level. Putty Willits, as she was known, is one of the two people, women in the world, who are in both the field hockey and lacrosse Hall of Fame. Joanne Harper went on from being my junior high school 
gym teacher who taught me to play in the goal. She'd been a, she was an All-American goalkeeper at Westchester. She went on to be the not only a World Cup U.S. coach, but uh, head coach of the women's lacrosse program at Dartmouth and the first woman to be an athletic director in the Ivy League. These women just happened to be my gym teachers in junior high school and high school. So um, I was really lucky. And luck has a lot to do with success in athletics. And any one of you who knows success know that. Good luck plays a big role. I played on undefeated, untied teams in both sports my senior year in high school. In field hockey, we outscored our opponents 33 to 1. I can still tell you how that one goal was scored, and it still bugs the blank out of me. All right. Um, I was, of course, captain of one of those teams. I then arrived at Yale in September 1972, just as Title IX kicked in, a member of only the fourth class of women admitted to Yale and had the good luck to start in the first varsity game ever played in any sport by women at Yale. I was one of the first 11 women who can say that. We were the first varsity team. We got the first varsity letters. This sweater is quite possibly the first letter sweater a female person ever got at Yale because I was a freshman. I went to pick mine up the next morning after we got them. So. A bit later, I also had the privilege of starting on Yale's first varsity women's lacrosse team. So, Title IX pioneer, two-sport varsity athlete at the Division I level. I've also worn a Super Bowl ring because Gary Fensick of the Chicago Bears was a classmate of mine at Yale. And Branch Rickey's granddaughter taught me a lot about baseball. I've walked out onto World Cup fields and talking to the head coach about how things are going. I have been very, very fortunate. The reason I'm saying that is because, again, I, I love sports. They've been part of my life. And because I became a teacher, I've, continued, I've been able to coach both sports, which most of my teammates have not. Arriving at Hill, only the second year of OCO education, I had the joy and privilege of coaching at all three levels of field hockey and lacrosse at Hill and had the honor of being the head lacrosse coach the year the girls had their first winning season. Sports have been important to me and a beloved part of my life. Part of what attracted me to Hill 24 years ago was that it had just gone co-ed, and because of its location, I knew there was nothing standing between Hill and really strong programs in women's sports except the will to make it happen, hiring the right people and getting the right kids. and. The history, it shows it's been a great ride so far. But what I have learned most importantly from my experiences is the essential truth that sports are not life. Sports are a piece of life for some of us. They're a part we tend to overvalue precisely because they are not like life at its most confusing complex and challenging. We love them because relatively speaking, they are so simple. They provide a refreshingly oversimplified, in fact, rather childlike model or toy version of life. One with absolute winners and losers, where the winners take all. One where the tasks can be reduced to offense and defense marking and shooting plays, one with clear rules and clear outcomes, with clocks that run out and scoreboards that tell you reality. If only the rest of life were so simple and had such clearly marked boundaries in time and space. But as all of you grow older, you know it doesn't. Most of the time, the edges are fuzzy, nothing's ever quite over, and just when you think you've accomplished your greatest task, it just means you're now assigned the next one. That's reality, and that's life. There's much to be learned from sports, absolutely, but not all of it is good, and not all of it is character building. In fact, sometimes it can be character destroying. 
So here's some of the lessons that I wanted to share with you this morning. Lesson one, winning doesn't make you or your team or your school or your city better people. It just means on that day, under those circumstances, governed by an arbitrary set of rules, you won as defined by that sport. You know that when you lose, right? None of you think you're worse people when you lose. Remember that when you win. Lesson two, coaching is teaching, and you learn an enormous amount about teaching from coaching, in part because coaching, teaching someone to play lacrosse or field hockey, there's an immediate feedback. I can see whether that drill worked or not. I know right away, and I'm almost always team teaching with a colleague. Someone else is there. Every coach out there knows. You stood there saying, well, that drill didn't work, right? Or that's, and you know that right away. Because complex as some of the sports are at every level, um, teaching someone to cradle or drive how to set up a zone defense or react to a breakaway is, is pretty much less complex than analyzing the dynamics that lead to revolutions or civil wars or how to distinguish the attributes of the soliloquies of Hamlet or the biodynamics of the Krebs cycle. Not more or less valuable, but intrinsically less complex. You do it or you don't. The ball goes in the goal or it doesn't. Whether a wise political decision was made in 1857 is a, is a lot more fuzzy and takes, it's in, you're never going to get a real good answer to that one. And that's one reason it's fun and it's rewarding because it's a little simpler and we know when we've done it. My third lesson would be that coaches can be the best people in your lives and they can also be some of the worst. Mrs. Harper is still one of my favorite, most revered people in the world. Mrs. Willits was probably, who died last year at 97, um, was probably the best technical coach a person could ever have had. She was the worst game day coach I have ever worked with because she made the mistake of a, she couldn't keep herself from making our performance about her. And as soon as you do that as a teacher or coach, you have lost, you've lost the game. She was more, she, believe me, when we're getting angry with you, which we do, we shouldn't. Nobody wants to lose. People don't play badly on purpose. And punishing you for losing is not really a very constructive way to run a program, as every one of you who does it knows. Less, the next lesson is athletics or character building, but not always for the good. Learning that persistence pays off when facing difficult challenges is crucial to anyone's maturity. And it's an absolutely necessary life skill that athletic competition can really help develop. But it does so in precisely the same way as persisting with Latin grammar does, or persisting with problem sets in analytic geometry or chemistry struggling to understand the 18th century political language of the United States Constitution, or the agonizing creative struggle to find precisely the right words, notes, or brush strokes to express your aesthetic vision. And they, you learn these things in sports for precisely the same reasons. You're learning about yourself. You're learning your own strengths and weaknesses, how you do your best work, and when you're lucky and it all works out, you have the incredible, incomparable authentic joy of achieving mastery over something. And therefore, I want to offer the following proposition that it is quite possible that the most important thing you learn at Hill will happen in a classroom. And at a school, that's not a bad thing. It may happen on the playing field. It may happen in the dorm. But it might happen in a classroom, too. And that's OK. Lesson four or five. I've lost track here. Lesson, athletic competition can bring out the best in you, but it can also bring out the worst. You need to learn to lose well. And that's as important as learning to win with grace and humility. 
Playing on undefeated championship teams is not great training for real life. I speak from personal experience. I am still a terrible loser. I and it's, I really am. And it's, it's you know I was terrible. I'm not easy to coach either for the same reason. Believe me. So you know it's not it's, life isn't like that. You're not going to go through life being undefeated. It's fun, but believe me, reality hits hard. Demeaning, disrespecting, and dehumanizing your opponents diminishes you and undermines the quality of your own performance. It really does. The more you respect your opponents genuinely, the better you will play. Watch the pros on the baselines over the next few nights when they're talking to each other on the bases. Watch the way the professionals really greet each other in the middle of the field after a game or while they're warming up. You play your best against the people you respect the most. The quality of your behavior, not of your clothing or the quantity of points scored is the true test of your character and that of the community you represent. Berating, challenging, insulting officials is never appropriate. When is it appropriate? It never is, regardless of how many adults you watch doing it and the pernicious mythology that doing so is somehow helpful. It really is not. From my experience, it's my own weakness and frustration getting the best of me when I've done it. Been there, done that. It's a mistake. The officials are part of the game conditions, and the sooner you deal with it, the better game you're going to have. Every game is a problem to solve. You got your field or your pool or your track conditions. You got the officials and the way they're going to call it. And you got your opponents you're dealing with. And your job in the first few minutes of a game is to analyze all of them, accept that reality, and begin dealing with it. Not complaining about it. Okay. That's a waste of energy and counterproductive. The final lesson this morning, though, is that playing games is fun. We do it because it's fun. It should be fun, as is watching them. That's why we do it, and it's why humans seem to have always done so. Human, animals play games, too. We like to play. So find the fun, the joy, the exuberance every time you practice or play. And when the fun is fading or absent, remember, remind yourself. It's only a game. It really is. They are only games. And when they're over, they're over. And you can move on. But I have to close by saying this. Because fun is the point, winning is more fun than losing. There's no question about it. That's why I'm not a good loser. So go Phillies. Go Union Sunday night. Fly, Eagles, fly. Beat Lawrenceville. And the football game in 1923. Yale did win 13 to nothing. Thank you.